Well, thank you, Bill. Um, thank you, Center for Desert Archaeology. Uh, I was telling Linda, Linda Mayro, there's two good Lindas here, but this was Linda Mayro, uh, how incredibly pleased I have been. We can sort of exchange compliments here, but Bill may have learned a few things from me, but what he has done since he left, went to California and came back is pretty phenomenal, as I think you all uh, are well aware. Um, the recent, well, it's not all that recent, but his emphasis on preservation archaeology is something that is now really influencing uh, the archaeological world uh, throughout uh, the U.S. And what he is doing with the, the center, uh, I think, is obviously going to become a model for a lot of other work uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, he's really looking at the basic needs, the preservation of our archaeological records. So it's just really so good to be back here, uh, to see all of you, uh, and to be offered this opportunity uh, to talk to you today. Actually, there's a whole lot of you out here that, uh, that I know. Um, let me just make a real brief comment that I'm showing slides rather than PowerPoint, but I was assured by Linda Pierce when I said, well, I've got slides. She said, oh, that's okay. Bunny Fontana used slides <laughs> uh, when he gave his talk. So I thought, good, I'm in, I'm in good stead. And then Art Roan tells me he still used slides. So there's a few of us left. What? <laughs> What's PowerPoint? That's what Bunny wants to know. Uh, so at any rate, um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you today uh, and to uh, share uh, some, um, some thoughts about Chaco, because it is true. I love Chaco, and I've been looking out the door. Thank you all for coming on a day like this, looking out the door and seeing the rain come down and thinking, boy, the Chacoans would love this. So uh, with that, my, my focus today is really on, uh, on water. And when Linda asked me uh, to talk about some experiences in Chaco uh, and their relationship to current research uh, on prehistoric water use in Chaco, uh, I was really, really uh, glad to be given uh, this opportunity uh, because I believe that living in Chaco uh, leads to a better understanding of ancient Chacoan water use, and particularly for ancient Chacoan water use for uh, agriculture. It also gives me a chance to comment on a, a couple of recent political history scenarios of Chacoan prehistory uh, that downplay or even ignore the natural uh, world uh, in which the Chacoan cultural system uh, evolved. Uh, first, be before I, let me say that what I want to do is provide some introductory comments, then show you some slides, uh, and then wind up with some uh, ending comments. Uh, but before I start, let me just say that uh, though I suspect that everyone here, in fact, I'm sure quite a few of you here, are well acquainted with Chacoan prehistory, I'd like to briefly uh, summarize what I call the where, when, and what. Uh, of Chaco. Uh, for where, uh, the word Chaco's been used to refer to Chaco Canyon, uh, the Chaco Basin, and a cultural system centered uh, in the San Juan Basin of northwestern New Mexico, which I will get back to it in a moment, but that's essentially what you're looking at this first slide, is the San Juan Basin surrounded by all of these mountain chains in the northwestern corner uh, of New Mexico. Although attributes of the Chacoan cultural system appear in archaeological sites over a significant portion of the Colorado Plateau, uh, this system actually originated in Chaco Canyon and then expanded into the Chaco and the San Juan basins. We understand that system uh, much better, actually, as a result of the Center for Desert Archaeology's sponsorship of a project to research and publish Cynthia Irwin Williams' work at the Chacoan Salmon Ruin Outlier. And if you see Farmington there, the little dot for Farmington, that uh, site is very near Farmington. Cynthia did a lot of work there, never really finished up all of the work that she did in terms of writing it up. 
the center took on that responsibility. This to me was really, really neat because here's the center in southern Arizona and yet they're quite willing to go to places well out of southern Arizona where the need is really important to be able to provide additional information on archaeology outside southern Arizona. So at any rate, <coughs> Paul Reed uh, published uh, a series of volumes on all of that work and that has considerably expanded our knowledge of the relationship of the central Chacoan area to that area up on the San Juan River. When uh, Chaco emerged as an identifiably archaeological entity in the last half of the ninth century and the first decades of the 10th century, its cultural juices simmered for almost a hundred years but then came to a significant boil in the first quarter of the 11th century, producing what Cynthia Irwin Williams called the Chaco phenomenon. That phenomenon lasted for about another hundred years and culminated in the uh, mid 1100s when Chaco Canyon was pr pretty much totally uh, abandoned, uh, as was uh, a large portion of the, uh, the central San Juan Basin. And finally, the what of Chaco. I'd like to begin uh, by uh, dispelling the notion that Chaco equals Chaco and great houses such as Pueblo Benito. I've spent a good part of my professional life urging scholars and the public to pay attention to the other half of Chaco and culture, and that is small house sites. Both of these sites are contemporaneous in Chaco for at least 300 years, the middle 800s to the middle 1100s. The most striking differences are architectural, as their names imply. Uh, the approximate dozen great houses in Chaco are planned, multi-story buildings with hundreds of rooms, whereas the largest small house sites, of which there are hundreds rather than a dozen, there are hundreds of these, are single story and seldom have more than 25 rooms. Great houses are associated with great kivas, elaborate water control systems, and Chacoan roads. Small house sites are not. Similar stark distinctions in other aspects of material culture, such as ceramics, are not as apparent, but in general, the inventory of material goods is richer in great houses. And I will simply make a note here that we know more about the ceramics in Chaco as a result of Barbara Mills' work there. It was great to see her here uh, this evening. The difference in architectural scale between great and small houses has triggered models of hierarchy to explain the structure of Chaco and culture. Three decades ago, these models examined growth and change in Chaco and culture within the context of the natural environment. Within the past two decades, 15 years to two decades, however, the trend in explanatory scenarios has been either to remove the Chaco and social and political system from its natural context or to emphasize negative aspects of the environment. Thus, many archaeologists now subscribe to a ritual-based model in which Chaco and great houses are viewed as ceremonial centers for a vast area in and around the San Juan Basin. Other archaeologists use more political-based models. Steve Lexon's, what I term, Chaco and Kings scenario may be the best known in his A History of the Ancient Southwest Chaco and great houses are viewed as palaces for kings. Based on my sporadic but long-term experience of living and working in Chaco and being strongly influenced by my father, who had an almost continuous association with Chaco from 1929 to 1965, I'm convinced that an understanding of Chaco and culture must involve a greater awareness and appreciation of the natural world in which that cultural system evolved. I believe that water was a vital resource for Chacoans and that it played a major role in the evolution of their cultural system. To help make my case, I want to show a few slides that relate to water in Chaco. Its natural forms of occurrence, how it gets to Chaco, how it was used for agriculture, 
and how Anglos living in Chaco learned from Chaco in use. Finally, I would like to look at its de potential destructiveness as well as its benefits. And there are a few slides of a structural feature in Chaco, the recent interpretation of which quite succinctly reflects the shift away from seeing Chaco and culture is operating within an ecosystem. So with that, we'll move to the slides and I'll move out so that, good, there, okay. I've already indicated that we're looking at the northwestern corner of New Mexico. This is the San Juan Basin. It's surrounded by mountains. They continue on this side. Essentially what this does is form a rain shadow effect so that storms coming from any direction towards the San Juan Basin are blocked. As a result of this, the average annual precipitation on the interior basin, and here's where Chaco Canyon is right here. So Chaco Canyon is in the interior basin. The average annual precipitation is eight and a half to nine inches a year, which is right on the very marginal edge of precipitation you need for any kind of agriculture. So that uh, the Chaco in culture is pretty remarkable that we had the kind of evolution of that culture within this area, given uh, the extremely low um, uh, moisture level on an annual basis. Next slide. There was another problem as well, I guess, oh, oh. Thank you, Pat and Linda. Uh, there is another problem in, with respect to the water coming into Chaco is that storms in the, in the winter come primarily from the north, storms in the summer come primarily from the south, and they swing up towards the San Juan Basin. However, if northern storms turn before they get to the San Juan Basin, you don't get practically any winter moisture. If summer storms come and turn before they get to the San Juan Basin in the summer, you get very little or no summer moisture. So that in those years when the southern storms don't go far enough north and the northern storms don't go far enough south, it's really tough for people living in Chaco. On the other hand, if the opposite is true, then that's a particularly good year uh, for people living here. So the, the San Juan Basin is in such a position as to be uh, really dicey if you're an agriculturalist. Okay, next slide. What we're looking at here is a satellite photo of the lower half of Chaco Canyon. Uh, for those of you who have been there and know, this is Fajada Butte with the visitor center right here. This is Gallo Canyon. Uh, this is the Chakra Mesa bordering the canyon on the south side. It continues here and continues for some considerable distance to the east. Uh, this is the Escavado Wash that the Chaco Wash joins. And <clears throat> primarily what I want to point out in this slide is the difference in uh, physiography between the south side of the canyon, the Chakra Mesa, and the north side. Essentially what you get on the south side is a series of benched uh, cliffs dropping down to the canyon bottom and then long tailless slopes at the bottom of those benches. We'll see a slide in just a moment to see uh, more precisely this process of benching and tailless slopes uh, at the bottom. On the north side, however, you get a lot of exposure of bedrock, short little side canyons as opposed to a lot of deep side canyons on the south. Uh, and essentially what you get is a sheer cliff as it drops into the canyon, a bench, and another sheer cliff here. In the case of the north side of the canyon, when you get summer precipitation, it tends to run right off into the Chaco Wash and is lost. So if you're a farmer in Chaco Canyon and you're on the north side, you're in trouble unless you can capture that water as it comes out of those side canyons. If you're a farmer in Chaco Canyon, and are living on the south side, the, and the water is soaking into the ground, you're in a much better position for uh, carrying out a kind of agriculture such as ok chin, or at the mouth of the wash. In other words, various kinds of floodwater farming 
are quite easily practiced on this side of the canyon. And we know that historically, Navajos were conducting that kind of agriculture on uh, this side of the canyon. Next slide. Okay, we're just, uh, this is uh, Chaco Canyon in the winter. We're on the top of the mesa, we're on the north side. This is the Chakra Mesa on this side. This is a break in the mesa called South Gap. And we're looking off to the Dutton Plateau. If you went over here, you'd be in Gallup, New Mexico. This is a, a, a critical resource for Chacoans was winter moisture. Winter moisture provides about half of that total annual precipitation. It's particularly, it was particularly important on the south side uh, because the sun is so low uh, in the south during the winter that snow stayed on the south side much longer. It soaked into the ground and provided moisture for the uh, germination of, uh, of crops in the spring. So uh, winter moisture is really critical uh, to Chaco. Next slide. This is Again, the same, we've moved just a few feet to the right. We're still looking through the south gap. Here is the Dutton Plateau, which in all of this haze is difficult to see. But this slide was taken in July, mid-July 1974, I believe. And next slide, please. This was one month later after the rains had come uh, to Chaco. We're looking at the same location through South Gap, uh, Dutton Plateau with Hosta Butte on the top, so that this hopefully will, will illustrate how effective moisture can be in a very short period of time with respect uh, to the natural growth in, in Chaco, as well as to water that would be collected for farming. Next slide. Uh, this, we spoke about the physiography of the south side of the canyon. Once again, South Gap. This is what I'm talking about, these series of benched cliffs coming down, then reaching a point where the water comes over, but there are these long tailor slopes that capture the water. These are drainages which can be used for that auction type farming. This is the Chaco Wash in the center of the canyon. There is only one in the space of about 16 miles, only one place where water running out of the south side of the canyon cuts a channel and drains into uh, the Chaco Wash. This slide was taken from the north side. We're standing up on one of those benches or those high uh, mesa tops uh, looking across the canyon to the south side. Next slide. And this is an example of the small house site. These are literally hundreds of these little small structures, not very good masonry, single story, um, never more than practically 25 rooms, and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these on the south side where one can do a number of kinds of farming, primarily auction, but there's also dune farming like the Hopi do, um, and additional tailless slope farming. Next slide. Here in this case, we've switched. We're looking at the other side of the canyon, the steep cliffs, the bench above them, and then another cliff edge up here. And here is one of those little side canyons that we say cut the north side of the canyon a great deal. And the cottonwood here show where that channel is coming out. The slide doesn't show it. But in every single one of these side canyons, that water cuts a channel, runs down into the Chaco Wash, and is essentially lost if you are uh, a Chaco and wanting to do agriculture in Chaco. Next slide. Here is a central portion of Chetra Kettle, one of the great houses uh, in Chaco Canyon, uh, multi-storied core and veneer masonry, uh, enormous beams. Uh, you can see one of the beams here and here, uh, hauled in from up to 100 miles away, uh, three to four stories in height, a totally different kind of picture than you see on the south side, where here we have a, I will argue, here we have a massing of population. There are others who see great houses as being occupied by only a handful of people. But I think that these were large residential structures uh, that um, evolved over time and uh, provided uh, the labor force that was needed for the kind of agriculture that was carried out on the north side of the canyon. Next slide, please. 
Here's the Choco Wash. Now, Pat and I were just running through these earlier this afternoon, and I said, first of all, oh my God, it's an ancient slide with all of these things. It's, it's deteriorating. Uh, that was taken uh, in the 40s, and this was at a time when the University of New Mexico Field Station was still there. These are those buildings there that were taken down. The whole point of it is, is that a lot of water that runs into Chaco now and through those side canyons on the north side of the canyon winds up in the Chaco Wash, where it then runs out of the canyon and is lost. So all of this potential water that could be used for agriculture today is completely gone. Next slide. Uh, agriculture was not only carried out in Chaco Canyon, but outside the canyon. This is a, a slide of the um, uh, Kinbiniola Great House. Um, I wouldn't put it in Chaco and outlier status, but it's outside of Chaco Canyon. Uh, typical kind of that uh, multi-storied Chaco and Great House architecture. And here is the Kinbiniola drainage, a massive drainage that um, is one of the largest drainages outside of Chaco Canyon. And what was happening here is that the people who were living in Kinbiniola were taking water off from the Kinbiniola from behind massive dams and carrying it in very large canals uh, to fields. Next slide. This is a Richard Wetherill photo of Professor Putnam uh, who came out um, to uh, help direct the excavations at Pueblo Bonito and didn't stay long and left George Pepper there to do the work for him. But at any rate, Professor Putnam is on his horse in one of these canals. It runs from here to here. This is edged by a masonry wall on this side and they got a couple of Navajos to stand on either side of the canal. The important point here that I would like to make is that Richard Wetherill was fully aware of enormous canals being taken off from drainages in the Chacoan area and being that they were then run to uh, agricultural fields. Next slide. Uh, this is one of those field areas, maize corn just coming up. This is just slightly down valley from where we were at Kinbiniola. Uh, the Navajo living there today. Actually, today they're doing less agriculture. This uh, slide was taken in the 70s. Uh, but nonetheless, the Navajos have been farming there for 100 years or more uh, and getting bountiful crops. They even had fruit trees uh, at one time. So if you handle the water correctly uh, in Chaco, you can get good production. Next slide. This is uh, a Judd photo of Pueblo Benito uh, that Judd took, Neil Judd came to the canyon in the early 20s after Richard Wetherill and the Hyde Expedition had excavated a portion of the, uh, of the Pueblo here. Judd came uh, with, uh, from Smithsonian and with funding from the National Geographic to complete uh, the excavation of uh, Pueblo Benito. When he got there, uh, and he was aware of it before, one of the things that he saw was this big berm right here, which was a berm that Richard Wetherill had built to collect water running down the canyon to use for irrigation uh, in a, a lot of his crop areas. So that Richard Wetherill was quite aware of the ability to capture water and how Chacoans had captured water previously and took advantage of this uh, by building this, this large berm right here, which came right up to the edge of, of Pueblo Benito. Incidentally, I will say that Judd, these are the refuse mounds in front of Pueblo Benito. When Judd was there, he trenched in front of those refuse mounds and found canals. Um, work was uh, done not too very long ago by a um, couple of archaeologists, University of New Mexico, that Barbara and I know very well, uh, Chip Wills and Patty Crown, and well, Bill and uh, Linda know her well because uh, Patty was also here for a while working at, with the museum. At any rate, Chip and Patty reopened the trenches that Judd had put in and confirmed, as far as I'm concerned, that there were canals running in front of uh, Pueblo Benito. Next slide. Now, thank heavens for Linda Pierce. 
who uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but she has a project that we sure hope at one of these times is going to get funded in which she wants to take Charles Lindbergh's aerial photos of a number of places in the Southwest, including Chaco Canyon, uh, and then have Adriel Heise flow the, fly the same area and compare the photos at that time. I think it was a fantastic project, and I especially love it because she gave me this slide. <laughs> so, what we're looking here, we just were looking at Wetherill's Reservoir. Here is Wetherill's Reservoir. We were seeing it from the cliff looking across this way in that other slide. Here is Pueblo Benito. And what, and here is Chetra Kettle, which was um, starting to be excavated this same year. It's very interesting. Uh, Chetra Kettle was starting to be re-excavated by Hewitt, who had worked there earlier. Lindbergh flies this aerial, and my father goes to Chaco for the first time. So 1929 is sort of a neat year. What's important is this is the uh, rincone that water was coming out, coming down, and was being captured by Wetherill. So he understood this process. Then there is this next rincone in which water is coming out, and in this case, it's doing what it's doing today, running straight to the Chaco Wash. Prehistorically, however, they were capturing this water and running it to, aha, this funny thing here, this X. Now, it's really interesting. I don't know, after Lindbergh took this photo and it was printed, if people like Neil Judd looked at it and thought, what the hell is that? Because they, he was not aware of it at that time. So you have this big sort of, there's a quadrant, here is this, big area here, another one here defined by this line, and so on down here. I don't know whether it shows up for you, but there are lighter lines going across this way. These are grids, like Las Capas, only on a bigger, um, bigger scale. Uh, these grids are about 45 feet by 75 feet. Anyway, Lindbergh took this photo. It languished for a while and really, really sort of forgot about it until Linda began looking at all of these, uh, these photos. Next slide, please. Well, we're talking about that water coming in the side canyons. I just wanted to point out here is water pouring over the cliff edge very near the back of Pueblo Benito. This is the kind of thing that's running here. It's running down in the front. It's coming out and helping to feed those side canyons that currently today are running into the Chaco Wash. Next slide. In the 1950s, my father flew over this area, and this is that area of these gridded gardens. If you can see the lines here, you can see those grids. Okay, and what was happening is water was coming out down this side canyon into here, but it wasn't cutting at that time. The Chacoans channeled it down to about this point where they had a gate, a big masonry gate, took the water off, ran it in other canals into this area, and then distributed it into these grids through little small field gates in, the, in these various areas here. Okay, next slide, please. This is one of those field gates uh, that we excavated in 1971. Uh, a little masonry on both sides, a little channel through. They actually had it covered with slabs, and this just trans, they caught water in a in a canal coming up, ran it through it, and then distributed it into the, um, into the big, large, gridded area, which clearly was established for agriculture. This, they found the same thing at Las Capas here in the work that um, Desert Archaeology has done, in that it makes real good, efficient use of water by distributing water within a confined space where it will be equal amount of water throughout that, uh, that defined area. Next slide, please. Okay, the Vivians at Chaco. Uh, this is my father, as Pat said today, God with a cigarette in his mouth. Uh, but at any rate, uh, what we're doing here is preparing to cross the Chaco Wash. It's one of the fond memories I have of that you always hoped when you went off uh, on a trip uh, that you would get stuck. Uh, and preferably in the Chaco Wash. Uh, in this case, what we're doing is building up the bank on this side with brush so we can 
make a die or make a run for it, possibly by my mother who's taking the picture and was usually in the truck doing the driving across so we could push uh, to hope to get to the other side and uh, we could go on home. Next slide. Uh, this wasn't that trip, uh, but it's quite typical of the kind of, um, of experiences that we often have. In this case, we finally gave up. Here's the chain, obviously going to another truck that's going to pull us out after we have just given up trying to dig ourselves out. Uh, next slide. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this is the, this is the, in the late 1950s, the National Park Service decided to um, pave the road, just a, a loop road in Chaco. Uh, and this is that road. And um, this, is, this is that very drainage that goes to the gridded fields out here. This is the one that goes up this way and up into that little canyon. So when the engineer came out, and my father was working there, and the engineer began pushing all this dirt into this place to fill it up, and my father said, I think you probably better put in a culvert. And the engineer said, no, no, no. The dirt that I am putting in here is wide enough. It will block the water. The water will back up. There's never a chance uh, that the water will ever cut through the road. Well, after the first big rain, this is what happened. And they came and put culverts uh, in all of, the, uh, all of the side channels. They filled up every one of these side channels with dirt. They had to take it all out, put in culverts, and put the road back over the top. Next slide, please. And finally, even the Chacoans themselves sometimes underestimated the power of this water. This is one of the major gates taking water off from that side canyon and running it into a canal that will go to those gridded fields. This is the remains of a series of masonry walls on either side of that channel heading the water into the gate, which was completely washed out and the, the water carried the stones up and pushed them up against the gate. So even the Chaco ones had problems at times uh, with respect to the, the velocity and the power of, uh, of this water. I think that's, we can go next, but I think that's the last slide. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, my father was using what has been termed <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what has been termed local ecological knowledge by two contributors to a recent book uh, titled Panarchy, Understanding Transformations in Human and Natural Systems. In their chapter, two of these contributors, Burks and Folk, define three levels of what they identify as folk ecological knowledge. Local knowledge is held by a specific group of people whose knowledge comes from observation of the local environment. Indigenous knowledge is held by indigenous peoples and traditional knowledge is gained over many generations and passed on as a group or as the group adapts to the environment in which they live. I would add that the term also convey the critical concept of place a locale precisely defined by its occupants and embodied with both secular meaning and sacred values. Traditional knowledge would certainly characterize the Chacoan population. The fairly recent Navajo held indigenous knowledge and a small group of Anglos had local knowledge. These would include a few traders and ranchers, but two families, the Wetherills and the Vivians, especially represent this group. They actually lived in Chaco Canyon, and based on the time that they lived there, dealt more intimately with the natural environment as a part of daily life. This led to an increased awareness and perception of the potential and limitations of that environment. Certainly, my father was aware of the natural world surrounding him at Chaco. I believe that I also was absorbing a sense of that word, which for me in many ways was defined by water, though initially in not very profound ways. For instance, I remember being reprimanded for having a long water fight with Al Lancaster's sons, and Art will know them, one summer afternoon. The Lancaster boys coming from the bone dry bean field country of southwestern Colorado were in even more trouble than my sisters and me. 
I also recall my mother yelling, get out of the damned quicksand when we played in the Chaco Wash after it flooded. And as I've noted before, we always believed that a weekend excursion to look for sites was not complete if we didn't get stuck and hopefully in the Chaco Wash. But I also became, a, became aware of water in all seasons. Most archaeologists know Chaco primarily from the summer when it is easiest to do field work. And summer rains frequently cause the Chaco Wash to run so those archaeologists associate water in Chaco with the Chaco Wash. While that water was important to Chacoans, it probably was never significant for Chacoan farming, whereas other water was. In addition, being in Chaco made it increasingly clear to me that great house groups and small house communities depended on different water sources for farming. A similar awareness of water came quickly to Richard Wetherill, who clearly understood and appreciated the value of water in Chaco. His wagon load of supplies to begin the first season of excavation at Pueblo Benito in 1896 included a barrel of water, and he soon dug two wells in the Chaco Wash because he knew that he would be in Chaco year round. He also paid close attention to the agricultural water use of the resident Navajo who practiced both floodplain and Ochin farming within and adjacent to the canyon. A particular interest, however, was the fact that Wetherill was aware of Chacoan engineering to move water via canals to field areas, and we have seen that he duplicated much of this effort when he diverted runoff from a side canyon near the Chetrakettle Great House and channeled it to his reservoir. Given that resource, that, that reservoir, Wetherill was able to plant 60 acres of corn, five acres of wheat, and two acres of vegetables, which considerably supplemented the basic supplies that they had to haul in by wagon. I had a small garden in Chaco for a couple of years, but I watered it with a hose, and we would have starved <coughs> if we had had to depend on that garden for food. Uh, we did depend on rabbit hunting in the winter, though not with a bow and arrow, and my sister Anne, who was a crack shot with a 22 rifle, kept my father busy making rabbit sausage. Early archaeologists working in Chaco tended to be more aware of environmental constraints and the Chacoans' attempts to work within those limitations. Both Edgar L. Hewitt and Neil Judd, who we've mentioned earlier, and who respectively excavated the Chetra Kettle and Pueblo Benito great houses in the 1920s, they were aware of Wetherill's water use plan and the large canals at Kinbiniola. And as I've already mentioned, Judd discovered canals running in front of Pueblo Benito. However, not too sh long after that, not everyone remained on board. In less than a decade, Donald Brand a geographer who directed the UNM Field School in Chaco in 1936 derided, quote, certain archaeologists who trace the outlines of prehistoric irrigation systems on the present surface of the canyon floor. He suggested they must have assumed that, quote, some patron saint of archaeologists halted the processes of nature at the proper historic moment, leaving the old occupational surfaces revealed to the delighted eyes of modern savants. The recent emphasis on ritual-based or political king-based scenarios for interpreting Chaco has again raised new doubts about the existence of agricultural water control systems in Chaco. Indeed, they posit that given saline soils, a short growing season, and frequent minimal pre precipitation, only a few hundred individuals could have been sustained in Chaco Canyon, or others argue that most food, particularly maize, was imported into Chaco from the Chusca and San Juan Valleys. But how does one account for the archeological remains of what I believe are water control systems? The Chetrakettle gridded fields figure significantly in new scenarios for explaining Chaco. Frankly, it's interesting how many explanations of these grids have been offered to counter their use for agriculture. These include mortar mixing pits for construction at nearby Chetra Kettle, or they've been suggested that they were the foundations of a never completed great house, though the plan and grid size conform to no known great house. 
Perhaps John Stein and Taft Blackhorse, archaeologists with the Navajo Nation, have offered the most curious explanations. They propose that the grids are actually, quote, a playing field where the gambler, who was a figure in Pueblo and Navajo mythology, would engage challengers in a golf-like game, end quote. But they concede that there may be some merit in the suggestion offered by a geologist that the grids, quote, would be more useful for raising frogs or freshwater shrimp than growing corn. This is proposed despite the fact that both maize and cucurbit pollen was recovered from the grids. And finally, Steve Lexon, I like Steve, but. <laughs> finally, Steve Lexon states that, quote, Chaco is a famously poor place to farm and Chacoans knew it, end quote. Therefore, water in Chaco, according to Steve, was architectural with waterworks, quote, planned into the larger cityscape. He states, imagine the impact of Chaco ponds and gardens on a traveler who has just crossed the surrounding desert. I once asked Steve what was growing in the gardens and he suggested marigolds. That's true. That is true. I have a hard time accepting marigolds, frogs, and freshwater shrimp as basic elements of a Chacoan traditional ecological knowledge gained through more than 500 years of living in the canyon. Moreover, the essential rejection of any agricultural association with these features is puzzling inasmuch as it suggests an almost total lack of a farming tradition within Chacoan ecological knowledge. The tendency to focus fairly exclusively on the social aspects of a system rather than on feedback and linkages between social and ecological systems seems increasingly common in Chacoan studies. Linking the systems, as Burks and Folks admit in the book Panarchy, is a daunting task. But given the archaeological record and indigenous and local knowledge, it is not impossible. My father had that knowledge, and I would like to think that I share that with him. Ultimately, we must consider and relate to both systems if we are to truly understand places like Chaco. Actually, in the case of Chaco, and I suspect in many other areas, I believe that it is the natural system that often calls the shots. In the 1960s, my father wrote me the following. As I drove back to the house this evening, I noticed how sharply the ruins of Penasco Blanco stood out on the western horizon. Its outline was so distinct that I felt I could trace the tops of the broken walls out into the shapes of the original rooms, making the Pueblo appear as it must have 900 years ago. As the lowering sun forced the outline into shadows and Penasco was lost in the November evening, I was suddenly conscious of how very transient man is in the canyon and how our existence here matters little more than did the existence of several thousand Anasazi nine centuries ago. Man has come and attempted to change the canyon, but ultimately the natural order has prevailed and man's presence is marked only by the remnants of abandoned pueblos on the horizon and broken fragments of pottery vessels on ancient refuse heaps. A chilly wind blowing in through the south gap told me that winter had come, as it has so many times before to the Chaco, and that spring would arrive whether we were here or not. Thank you. <laughs>